In the last unit, we learned that subsonic and supersonic flows have the opposite reactions to changes in area. For example, a converging nozzle accelerates a subsonic flow, but decelerates a supersonic one. But what happens when the flow is sonic? We can investigate this by taking our equation for the differential velocity change from the last unit and multiplying through by 1 minus the Mach number squared. We obtain that the area dilatation is equal to m squared minus 1 times the velocity dilatation. Substituting m equals 1 for sonic flow, the factor of m squared minus 1 on the right hand side is going to be 0, thus the area change dA equals 0. This is telling us that sonic flow can only occur where the area is not changing locally. The implication is that a Mach number of 1 must occur at either an area minimum or an area maximum where dA dx is equal to 0. Let's consider these two possible sonic points. First let's look at the case where we have an area minimum in the nozzle that converges and then diverges. If we assume the flow starts off subsonic, then the converging section of the nozzle is going to accelerate it towards Mach 1. If the area shrinks enough, the flow could reach Mach 1 at the area minimum, and once the flow has reached the sonic point, the diverging area downstream can then act as a supersonic nozzle, accelerating the flow well beyond Mach 1. Now let's turn our attention to when we have an area maximum. If we assume the flow starts off supersonic, the initial diverging part of the nozzle will accelerate the flow to an even higher supersonic Mach number, and will only begin to decrease once the flow reaches that converging part of the nozzle. So if we start out supersonic, we'll definitely have supersonic flow at the area maximum, not sonic flow. If we start out subsonic on the other hand, that initial divergence will act as a diffuser, and we'll then have an even lower subsonic Mach number at the area minimum. This implies that only a converging diverging nozzle, such as the one shown in the top image, um, is going to produce sonic flow where there's no area change. This type of nozzle is known as a Delaval nozzle after its inventor, and it's the only means to accelerate a subsonic Mach number to a supersonic one via a steady process. Now we have a reasonable understanding of how area changes affect compressible flows, but how do we actually solve compressible nozzle flow problems? For example, let's say that I have a converging diverging nozzle such as this one, where the flow at the area minimum is sonic. This area minimum is also known as the throat. Now if I know the exit area of the nozzle, how do I compute the exit Mach number? In order to do this, we need to relate the flow at any point in the nozzle where the Mach number is m to the critical state where the Mach number is 1. To do this, we start with the continuity equation, which relates the mass flow rate at any point, rho v a, to the mass flow rate at the throat, which is given by rho star a star v star. Dividing through by rho v times a star, we find that a on a star is equal to rho star on rho times v star on v, which we label equation 1. To put the right hand side in terms of the Mach number, let's consider each of these ratios individually. Okay, first let's look at rho star over rho. If we multiply and divide by rho naught, this becomes rho star over rho naught multiplied by rho naught over rho. Now in the earlier module, I believe it was on stagnation pressure, we already derived expressions for both of these quantities, so let's make use of these here. Rho star on rho naught is just equal to 2 over gamma plus 1 to the power of 1 over gamma minus 1. And then rho naught on rho is equal to 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 2 times the Mach number squared, all to the power of 1 over gamma minus 1. So let's label this equation 2. 
So now we've got that first ratio in terms of the Mark number. So next let's look at V star over V. Now V star is nothing but the sound speed, it's the square root of gamma RT, but of course it's got to be evaluated at that critical temperature T star. And this is once again over V. Okay, so let's multiply and divide this expression by the temperature under the square root. So then we get gamma RT multiplied by the square root of T star over T all divided by V. So we can recognize that this expression here is the sound speed A, so V on A is just the Mach number. So now this becomes 1 on the Mach number multiplied by this temperature ratio or the square root of it. Okay, so let's do the same trick that we did with the density and we're going to multiply and divide by T naught. So when we do that we're going to get the square root of T star over T naught multiplied by the square root of t naught over t. Now we derived expressions for both of these in uh, previous modules as well. Uh, so once again we'll make use of those expressions. So this just becomes 1 on m times uh, 2 over gamma plus 1 to the half. And then this is just going to be 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 2 times the Mach number squared also to the power of a half. And let's label this equation 3. So once again we've got that ratio we're looking for V star on V in terms of just the Mach number. So if we combine 2 and 3 and substitute these into equation 1 you can see that we've now got an equation that we can use to solve nozzle flow problems. It relates the area at any point relative to the throat area to the Mach number at that point. If we want to design a nozzle that produces a Mach 5 flow for example, this equation directly tells us the area ratio that we need relative to the throat. If we know the area on the other hand, then we would need to iteratively solve for the Mach number. Next, let's look at the area ratios that are predicted by equation 4 over a wide range of Mach numbers. We immediately notice something interesting. For a given area ratio, the flow could have two possible Mach numbers, one subsonic and one supersonic. And this makes sense because if we think back to the Delaval nozzle, a given area A1 occurs both in the subsonic and the diverging supersonic portion of the nozzle. This implies that the state of a compressible flow at any point in the nozzle depends not only on the local area but on how the flow arrived at that area. Let's put this knowledge to use by solving an example problem. In this example, flow enters a nozzle from a gas turbine with a Mach number of 0.1 and a stagnation pressure of 180 kPa, which we're going to label state 1. We need to design a nozzle which is going to accelerate that flow and expand it to a Mach number where the static pressure is 100 kPa to match ambient, and we'll label that state 2. The first thing we need to do is figure out what Mach number do we need to expand the flow to in order to reach 100 kPa. If we're going to achieve that with a converging nozzle like the one drawn here, that Mach number needs to be less than 1 because we can only reach a maximum Mach number of 1 with a converging nozzle. To get the flow to go supersonic we'd need a throat and then a diverging section of the nozzle downstream. So how can we calculate the Mach number that we need to reach? We can do that from the ratio of the stagnation pressure at the exit to the static pressure at the exit. So we already know the stag static pressure is 100 kPa. The stagnation pressure at the exit is going to be equal to that at the inlet because we've got isentropic flow through this nozzle which means that stagnation pressure is constant. So that stagnation pressure is 180 so the ratio is 1.8 and we could solve for the Mach number by inverting the relationship between this pressure ratio and the Mach number, which we've derived previously. 
But to make things a bit faster, we're going to make use of a compressible flow calculator developed by Virginia Tech, which is going to solve this relationship for us. So in this flow calculator, we need to input what we know, in this case, the static to stagnation pressure ratio, and it's going to be the inverse of that 1.8 that we just calculated, so it's 0.5556, and then we hit calculate, and it's solved um, that Mach number relationship for us. So we find that the Mach number we need to reach is 0.96. So we can achieve this with a converging nozzle only because it's subsonic. This calculator also solves equation four, which we looked at previously. So it calculates for us the ratio between the exit area and the critical area A star. So let's just make use of that because our main job here is to calculate the nozzle area ratio. So we now know A2 on A star is 1.00. One six. But this raises an interesting question. We don't actually achieve sonic flow anywhere in this nozzle, so that means we don't have some area where we're reaching Mark 1. This isn't a problem. We can always um, hypothetically extend our nozzle um, to the point where we would reach sonic flow. So this is a, a virtual throat, if you like. Um, it's the area that we would need to contract the flow to in order to reach Mark 1, but it doesn't matter that we don't actually do this in our physical nozzle. Now if we want to design this nozzle, we need to know the real area ratio, say between the exit and the inlet. So we want to know A2 over A1. So to calculate this, let's multiply and divide by that critical area A star. Now we already know this area ratio here, so all that remains is to find A star over A1. And we can do this using equation four, um, which is also solved by a compressible flow calculator. So, and we just need to make use of the fact that the inlet mark number is equal to 0 0.1. So let's switch back to the flow calculator. So for the inlet, we know the mark number, and we know that it's 0 0.1. So we hit calculate, the calculator solves equation 4 and tells us that A1 on A star is 5.822. So let's use that, so A1 on A star is equal to 5.822, uh, which is the inverse of the ratio that we need to know here. So completing the calculation, a2 on A1 is going to be the 1.0016 divided by 5.822, which is equal to 0 0.172. So this tells us that in order to drop the static pressure down to 100 kPa, we need a nozzle with an area ratio of approximately 5.8, so it's contracting the area by that factor and that's going to produce a Mach number of about 0.96 at the exit, which is going to achieve the purpose that uh, our nozzle needs to be designed for. Okay, so this is a good example of how we can use um, the theory that we've developed in order to solve a simple nozzle flow problem, and it introduces the important concept that you can use a virtual throat. Um, the, the Mach number doesn't actually have to reach one within your physical nozzle in order to make use of these relations between the current flow state and the critical state. In the next module, or the next unit, we're going to look at um, another very interesting uh, compressible nozzle flow phenomena, which is that of choking.